Hi, everyone. Welcome again to another session of Dress and Drinks um, in our webinar series, Conversations on Dress. I'm Leon Webers. I am your host and a professor of costume design at Loyola Marymount University. And it's my great pleasure and super excited today to welcome our two guests from Kent State, Dr. Tamika Ellington, Associate Professor of Design, and Dr. Joseph Underwood, uh, uh, a Professor of Art History. I'll give you a little bit of background on both of them before we dive in to their upcoming exhibition called Textures, the History and Art of Black Hair. So Dr. Ellington is an associate professor at Kent State in the Fashion School and the interim assistant dean for the College of Arts. Her creative scholarship is inspired by African art and folklore. Her work has been shown internationally and her publications on hair have reached national and international recognition via peer-reviewed journals. She has two upcoming projects, uh, which include the exhibition we're talking about today, um, opening at the KSU Museum in fall of 2021, and is also writing an anthology entitled Navigating the Black Hair Phenomenon in a White, in a white World, with a release in spring of 2021. Um, and Dr. Underwood is a scholar and curator whose research focuses on artists from the African continent and the diaspora. As an art historian of the modern and contemporary periods, his projects focus on mid to late 20th century and encompasses themes of the post-war era, including post-colonialism, transnationalism, globalization, and biennialism. And the book, the while I haven't received it yet, I'm still waiting for the US Post to deliver the book on this. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Tamika. The exciting book, the book Textures and the History, the History and Art of Black Hair um, is on sale and we'll be putting a link in the chat later on for you all um, and is purchasable through many venues. Um, and just before we dive in, our cocktail today is the old fashioned made with Uncle Nearest Whiskey, um, which is a black owned distillery. I will put a link in uh, the chat for others, uh, which Dr. Ellington so generously shared with us. It is super delicious and yummy, and it is available at BevMo if you are in California or the West Coast or your other larger distributors. Um, look for it in the sealed off cases. Um, and uh, of course, always, I have to give a shout out to Ann Wass for today's mocktail recipe. A great pun as well, the newfangled mocktail. So um, with that, um, please welcome uh, Dr. Tamika Ellington and Dr. Joseph Underwood to talk about um, this upcoming phenomenal and super excited exhibition. I wish I was there in person to see it. So welcome Tamika and Joseph, thank you for coming today. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. I'm excited. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so before we dive into your presentation, which you have for us, um, because this is uh, yet to open, I have one question to start us off. What was the germination of this and the development phase? You know, it's it's been my life's work since I started as an academic uh, years ago. Uh, I decided that I wanted to research about hair. Uh, black hair has been such a controversial situation since the beginning of slavery, and it's still today very controversial. Um, and during the time that I started, uh, there was something called the natural hair movement that had just started. Um, that was back in the late, or no, early 2000s is when the natural hair movement started. And so, you know, people, uh, black women in particular, really started getting interested in, in just being themselves, um, get interested in uh, wearing their hair in its natural state. And so I wanted to find out what our culture was doing and why was this a change for us? And was it going to be able to stay? Was it a trend or was this going to be something that you know, continued on in our culture. And so I'm glad to say that it has continued on. Awesome. I think the exhibition was then kind of spurned with my arrival to Kent State about four years ago. And uh, Tamika approached me after hearing about some of my museum and curatorial expertise. And she said, you don't know me, but I have this idea. I've wanted to do this exhibition about hair 
and you seem like you've got some of the skills for it. Would you want to sit down and talk about a collaboration? And this was day one of the job, and I was like, absolutely, let's schedule a meeting. So yes. that's the, the some of the origin story. Those are always the most magical collaborations when it's like, you don't know me. You might think I'm crazy, but this is what we're going <laughs> to um, okay, so with that, um, let's dive in. Please talk to us about the exhibition. And this is the first exhibition that we featured on on uh, Dress and Drinks, so we're excited about that. So if you're in the neighborhood of Kent State when this opens, please go. Textures is going to be opening uh, September 10th of this year. Uh, we originally wanted to open um, last fall, but of course, with everything, you know, during the pandemic, it was a, a challenge. And we thought that this exhibition was too important to, to have it as a visual experience or a virtual experience. We want people to be able to get up close to the artwork, to really be able to, you know, be in the space and love, you know, what they were seeing and, and um, you know, just being able to just engulf themselves in that whole space because Kent State University, as most of you guys know, is a predominantly white institution. And so having an exhibition as large as this and it being the focus of black people um, is, is, a, is an amazing thing to do, you know, at, a, at an institution like that. And so, yeah. And just some context for thinking about the exhibition. There, of course, have been exhibitions about black hair before, some focused on art, some focused on more kind of artifacts or kind of the more costume and um, maybe even the advertising around black hair. But this is the first big show about hair in almost two decades and one of the first to be this comprehensive to include kind of vernacular objects, artifacts, um, advertisements and visual culture and fine art with over 55 artists in the exhibition. Wow, that's amazing. And so, you know, when we were conceptualizing the, the, the project, like I said, you know, when I saw Joseph and I heard about him, I knew he was going to be the perfect partner for me. And so, you know, textures really stemmed out of my personal experience as a Black woman um, and some of the traumas that I had, you know, experienced during, you know, my, you know, growing up trauma such as, you know, uh, losing my hair because of the chemicals that I was using, uh, traumas with um, dating, traumas with also to um, finding a job. You know, I was working for a local amusement park. I won't say the name, but local amusement park, I was working for them. And back then they had it like as a rule that you could not wear your hair in braids or locks or afros and so basically they were cutting out all of the kinds of hairstyle that black people could wear and i began to get really curious as to why society has such a a, a, um, a difficult time with the idea of black people wearing their hair without assimilation and so that's how the the, the concept came to be is you know out of my life experiences as a black female and you know, seeing what other women around me um, were experiencing and getting a chance to work with Dr. Joseph with his expertise in African art and curatorial expertise. So, you know, it just, it, me partnering with Joseph took the exhibition to a level that I would have never dreamed of. You know, my, my mind, you know, was, was here on it, but Dr. Dr. Joseph was like this. And he was like, you know, let's let's do this and let's make this large and grand. And um, I couldn't have done it without him. Um, uh, Tamika's been an incredible collaborator. I also just want to give a quick shout out to Sarah Rogers, the director at the museum. She's been uh, she's pretty new to Kent State, um, like me, but um, has been an amazing collaborator in helping this come to fruition. And I think part of the draw for the project is the timeliness of it as museums are reconsidering the stories that they tell. Museums aren't neutral. The kind of story you put up on the wall, it has a bias, it has a bent. And we have to also think about different audiences. So you might historically think of museums as catering to specific audiences, whether it's white or upper class, um, but the museum in the 21st century, and especially after some of the events of last year, we need to think about them as spaces that where we can strive for equity in representation, in storytelling, and 
you know, Tamika and I are both thrilled to think of this on campus all of next year, not just for our students to see these stories on the wall, but for all of the community members from Akron, Cleveland, and, you know, hopefully with a travel reopening, guests from, you know, other places. And so, uh, again, this just talks a little bit about the, the research and how the exhibition came to be. Uh, one of the things that was really important for us was to be able to deconstruct that stigmatization of uh, what black hair is. Um, and, you know, because there's still a stigma, you know, going on, there's been legislation that has had to be put in place because of it, which is another example of why this topic is so timely. So um, as we pulled together the different objects and artifacts and thought about the different stories we wanted to tell, we came up with three different categories. They're very broad. The categories kind of overlap, but it's a way um, to have three lenses as you move through the exhibition to think about the way that the stories can be told or different facets of black hair. The first is community and memory. The second is hair politics. And the third is black joy. And we have slides to break down each of those. So for many black people, their hair is woven into memories and mundane cleaning and care, highlights of self-discovery, a sense of belonging within, a, within or alienation from their social circles. And so, you know, looking at black hair and what it's meant to the people, you know, whether it's a way to bring the people together or it's a way to separate the people, it's done both. Black hair has done both of those things. And it's rarely an exercise you do by yourself. It tends to involve people, um, it brings families together, or even the family that you choose. You have to think about the time spent, invested in it, it's crafted, and the conversations that happen around it. So there's a lot of memories around hair. So some of the first objects we have actually are, you know, Egyptian artifacts. Um, this particular one um, didn't make it into the show because of some of the pandemic politics, but we do have um, ornaments from an Egyptian wig. We have some actual carvings of that show the emphasis on the hair. And so this just shows that, you know, even in the ancient times in the African continent, hair was a, an, a ritual that brought people together. It was a way of defining yourself, especially against other people. You know, we wear this hairstyle, they wear this hairstyle. You know, Many, many years ago, uh, the way in which you wore your hairstyle, like your hairstyle in Africa, was also a status symbol. It, you know, would represent whether or not you were royalty or whether you were a, a widow, uh, whether you were a warrior. So, you know, not only was it a way in which you can adorn your body, but it was also a way in which you identify within your, you know, community, your smaller community within your tribe. Mm -hmm. As we think about community, there are other stories to be told, some by artists like Devin Shimoyama, who's based in Pittsburgh. And so he does these huge um, collages. You can see on this one different material like feathers and jewels. And he's thinking about his perspective as a queer black man within barbershops. So we complicate a lot of the narratives. You know, it would be easy to kind of flatten them and say, oh, barbershops are just a place where every black person can get together. And it's not, there's, there's complicated stories. There's barbershops, salons, um, braiding salons. They all have different purposes and even different people have different experiences in them. So you can see the kind of big crystal tears coming out of his subject because it was a complicated relationship being a queer man in a kind of more uh, macho barbershop setting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And you cannot, you know, when you think about memory, you think about black hair, any black woman, if there's any black woman on this, on this call here, when they see that Annie Lee print, they'll know exactly what that is. You could not walk into a hair salon in the black community without seeing an Annie Lee artwork. And so that's why it was so important for us to be able to have that. Mm -hmm. Um, the last slide we had to introduce this theme is a piece by Mary Sabande um, from South Africa, one of my favorite artists. She does a life-size uh, mannequin and then takes a blue outfit. Blue is actually the color that domestic servants in South Africa wear. And so Mary Sabande, her mom, grandmother, and great-grandmother were all 
domestic servants in white households. So she takes that blue maid's uniform and turns it into this massive Victorian, almost super heroic kind of figure. And so for our exhibition, we're really fortunate to get this piece, which is uh, Sophie de Lucia. So Sophie's the name of this character in conversation with Madam C.J. Walker, who is the first African-American millionaire yeah. and earned her fortune on the creation of hair and beauty products for black women. And so she has this dialogue between women who are lifting themselves out of poverty, women who have stories that have been, you know, overshadowed in, in certain parts of history. And so this is a massive 16 foot diameter, um, you know, uh, kind of spectacle. It's one of the centerpieces of the exhibition, actually. I love this piece. This is so to the viewers, I, I promised uh, Tamika and Joseph that I would only respond, that I wasn't going to peek. And so I'm responding <laughs> in real time seeing these. This is friggin' amazing. I love this piece of art. It is so cool. The giant uh, Victorian dress, that skirt, the bow, the proportion and the scale of this is so interesting. And that um, CJ Walker's portrait is hair coming down that she is then working with like it's this is incredible it's a gorgeous gorgeous piece of art i love it yeah and i mean think about uh madam cj walker and how she has like her slick um polished hair and then mary sabandi's figure is actually still wearing her maid's bonnet so there's oh, even yeah. kind of that interesting kind of head to head comparison yeah yes exactly and they're on an equal plane with each other they're literally as you said, head to head. I mean, they're like, like it's so interesting and it's so wonderful. I just, I love the scale of this. It really is grand. It takes, it takes the, 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 the domestic, as you talk about the domestic, into a grand scale, um, into an almost aristocratic scale. Mm -hmm. It was really important for us to not just have this exhibition be about the black experience in the United States, we wanted to think globally. We have artists from Africa, Europe, South America, <laughs> um, Caribbean, and here that's, that's interesting, right? It's like a dialogue between South Africa and the US. They had a similar dialogue between civil rights and anti-apartheid movements. And yeah. so I just think there's some really fun ways of thinking about blackness globally, hair globally. Absolutely. And, you know, colonialism, uh, you know, happened all around the world. Uh, you know, many people in Africa are still suffering the effects of colonialism. And so black hair is not only the, you know, controversial topic in the U.S., but it's a controversial topic in Africa. It's a controversial topic in the Caribbean. Wherever you'll find black people, it's a, co it's a controversial topic. On that note... <laughs> Hair politics is our second category. Black hair is an unavoidable visual signifier that has been leveraged, disdained, celebrated, and scrutinized for centuries. In a, in a little bit of the catalog, we talk about how your hair becomes political. The mere fact of being a boy with dreadlocks and going to school becomes a political act because you end up in, the, in a newspaper headline because you had to cut your locks at school. Um, so it's politics, historically, it's the rise of the Afro, but it's even the, the way in which the personal becomes political. Yeah, and you know, it was really important for us to, to make it understood that it has been unavoidable. Black people never wanted our hair to be political. You know, that was not the purpose of, we just wanted to be able to adorn ourselves like everyone else. But because of the societal stigma, because of the racism and discrimination, black hair became political. Do you want to introduce your concept of texturism, Tamika? Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, within the black community, uh, there's something also called colorism. And uh, Alice Walker, the um, author, and also you guys probably know her uh, from her famous story, The Color Purple. Um, but Alice Walker was the very first author to coin the term colorism. And in the black community, colorism means uh, that if you are a light-skinned black person, you are more intelligent, more beautiful, more uh, less threatening. You know, and so on that on that scale, being uh, someone who is a dark 
brown skinned black person versus a light skinned black person, you know, you're going to be treated differently by society within your own race as well as within the greater society. And so within the um, research that I've done, uh, I developed a term called texturism, which is a sister term to colorism. And basically it just talks about the fact that, again, you know, the closer to white you are, the better you're supposedly uh, supposed to be. And so black people with straight, you know, long straight hair um, have a different experience in life than black people who have short kinky hair. And again, that goes into the, the, the image that we have here, uh, good hair. This is an amazing piece, I'm really, yeah. Yeah, so we have a couple artists who are reflecting on this notion of good hair. It's become this colloquial term of like, do you have good hair? Like, is your hair good? Which means straight and, and silky. So Nakia Brown has a series called The Refutation of Good Hair in which women with different kinds of textured hair are eating, choking on, you know, trying to force in this kind of more desirable hair, which tends to come or can come through some um, inserts like weaves or other, or wigs. Um, so you can see the figures kind of, it's kind of grotesquely choking on this notion of I need good hair because I have bad hair. Um, and also just even the good and bad, that kind of adding a moral quality to it. Is your hair good? Are you good? Is your hair bad? Are you a bad person? The one on the, the right is by April Bay. She's a Bahamian artist who lives in California and teaches there. And she is responding specifically to an influential film that came out about a decade ago called Good Hair, uh, which was a sort of documentary comedy film that Chris Rock put together. And she is critiquing him <laughs> for kind of coming into uh, women's space. They were doing a lot of um, tutorials and things on YouTube. And then he kind of came in as a man and made this documentary. So she took his poster and turned him into a clown and put that carnival font on there. And then the piece for the exhibition, it's actually covered with hair relaxer, which is not neutral. It's, it's got some potency in it. So it's going to affect that art and change the colors even as the exhibition goes on. But it, it's, it's back to that idea of like this external material you had to put on your hair to make it acceptable. I have a question about that piece. Is it is it printed on paper? And so will the hair relaxer like eat through the paper? Um, or is it on a canvas or some other kind of material? I'm super curious about what the progression of the hair relaxer on that object is going to do. Yeah, it's gonna be, um, it, there's it's kind of a, a denser panel and then the image is screen printed over top. Mm. I, um, you know, I'll just have to take pictures at month two and month four and send them to you and we can watch Sweet. it. We can watch it decompose together. <laughs> it could be like it could be like Empire. You just put a camera up and watch it like Andy Warhol's Empire. Like five months later, we're still watching this de de deteriorate. The uh, the movie Good Hair by Chris Rock uh, was it was not very well received amongst the black community. And that's the reason why, you know, April Bay had the response that she did. Uh, not only did he, I guess, kind of spill our dirty laundry, you know, but he also did it in a way where he didn't really explain why black women wanted to straighten their hair and why black women wanted to have long hair. He, you know, did not go into depth about the hurt a lot of the hurt that black women have because of the idea of having to assimilate. And so that's the reason why, you know, he's now portrayed as a clown because he really did damage, you know, to the black women in our, in our community because of that film, you know? And then um, the other art we had for this section kind of more directly engages with politics, mm -hmm. the actual mm -hmm. passing of laws, um, or or systemic discrimination. Um, do you want to talk about one or the other, Tamika? You know, I'll I'll talk about Battleship. Um, okay. Battleship Three by Charlie Palmer. Uh, this particular piece is a, an amazing piece of artwork. Um, it shows black people in a kind of a beautiful state, but also a very natural uh, state. And really, what Charlie 
Palmer is trying to get at is the fact that, you know, there is such a, a battle going on on the inside of us about our hair uh, because of the, you know, the forced assimilation, the, the forced, um, you know, having to reach this unreachable, you know, beauty standard and what that actually means to you as a person. You're, you're fighting against it, but you're also, you know, find, trying to figure out a way that you can still be um, acceptable within your society. Yeah. The notion of fitting into society at large is something that Sonia Clark has always been concerned with in her work. She's a textile art artist and a professor um, as well. And she is known for some of her flags. Sometimes she takes actual flags and unweaves them and then works with the audience or participants to weave the flag back together, but inserts other material like synthetic hair. This one's actually a painted flag. So you see the Confederate flag, and then she's used synthetic hair to weave on top of it to recreate the stars and stripes. So showing those two moments, those two um, ideologies within American history, but putting obviously an emphasis on kind of the black lived experience of it. When you showed me, I've, so I've, I've seen the black flag, the black hair flag by Sonia Clark in our conversation. And that's such an exciting, interesting, engaging, challenging piece to consider in all of it, given the, the I mean, the deep red background for me that evokes images of blood and um, in that way, plus also the weaving of the hair into it. Um, it's such a personal uh, uh, commentary on on the dual nature of our country of the confederate flag and the um superimposed on the american flag it's a really um arresting image in that way and equally the battleship like as when i first saw that i was just like oh my gosh that's it bring it evokes those amazing wigs of the 18th century but yeah. then starts to dismantle those it's like marie antoinette going like really being dismantled and and taken apart in the it it's fantastic and and relating also to the really sculptural qualities of black hair and some of the ones that you've shown earlier just those those the sculptural qualities um that the texture allows it to have is really amazing and i think really deftly brought out in these two images that you're talking about um have in com in conjunction with the other things really amazing yeah and we could not have an exhibition and talk about hair politics without talking about the you know the contributions that angela davis and the other people that you know were a part of that movement you know what they gave to us you know, in regards to Black acceptance, Black pride. And uh, so we were really blessed. We were able to get this piece from, I think it was the Yale Library, right, is where we got it from. Yeah. So this is an authentic wanted poster um, from when Angela Davis was pretty much on the run when the FBI was looking for her. Right. And yeah. it's, that, it's, it's in that era when the Black Afro, just the natural hair, you know, becomes associated with being radical or subversive just from having hair grow out of your head. But the image became associated, you know? Yeah. The third category. Oh, Black Joy. Black Joy is probably my favorite category. Um, Black Joy is a celebratory representation of self-love and cultural pride related to the concept of Black Black excellence, black joy, foregrounds aspirational imagery that expresses the magic, wonder, and spirit of thriving while being unapologetically black. And the reason why that as a black woman means so much to me is because we are always having to excuse ourselves. We are always having to taper ourselves down for people because either we're too threatening or, you know, we, um, we, we again need to assimilate into whatever the culture is. And so Black Joy being able to be a representation of who you truly are without making any excuses, without having to apologize or ask for acceptance from anyone. And even showing Black bodies that are not traumatized or suffering or stigmatized or being minority that's a political act to just foreground the joy. Yeah. 
Uh, it was important for us within this category to show products by Madam C.J. Walker, Dr. Willie Morrow, who's a, a major contributor to our show. It was so important for us, and, and Annie Turbin Malone, who is, a, 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 you know, she was one of the first people to also create black hair products. She was actually uh, the mentor to Madam C.J. Walker, and she opened up a college. And, you know, back then, it was still, you know, un unlikely that black people would get an education. And so for her to actually have a college uh, where black women can get educated on how to take care of black people's hair. The again, the the Madam CJ Walker products, you know, was a way to really demonstrate black joy during a time where black people were, you know, still struggling. Most of black people back then were still sharecropping. You know, they didn't have a lot of money and their, you know, Madam CJ Walker represented a way out. She represented that, you know, it could, something could really happen. And uh, Dr. Willie Morrow's book, 400 Years Without a Comb, is, is a um, legendary piece of Black joy because he was one of the first authors to really dive deep into what it was like for Black people being brought over, you know, into slavery and how uh, our hair evolved from being a, a, a symbol of identity to a, a symbol of uh, neglect, discrimination. Right. And I, I just wanted to note, because I think I don't think we said this, but the things we're showing you are just selections from each category because we have over 200 objects, and artifacts and artworks. So wow. some of the artists that we um, chose for this section just feature like beauty and regality, um, some just really stunning hair pieces. So we have some artists like Masa Zodros, um, who has um, kind of a Caribbean connection, and she does digital pieces, designs them digitally, and she synthesizes elements from traditional African cultures like certain masks or certain body modification techniques like tattooing and scarring, um, and then does these really fantastical um, hair pieces. And, and they have, you know, it almost looks like a bust, but not that kind of stuffy Beethoven bust. It's 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 a from an, a black woman's perspective of what regality might look like. And then with Kahindi Wiley, who some people might be familiar with because he was um, the artist who was chosen to do President Obama's official portrait, um, and and he has many other commissions and, and public pieces. He's a very well established artist. This piece we have of Tanisha Cricklow, he is inspired by traditional art history, something you might see in, you know, the 18th or 19th century galleries of painting. And he takes real life people from his world, real subjects, and puts them in that space. So it's interesting, Leon, you mentioned the, the Marie Antoinette wigs because that's what he's inspired by with this rendering. But in there, you can see a dozen different hair colors, textures, braids, all woven together to create that sculptural piece. Well, this is the, the Kehinde Wiley one is also really evoking images of Bridgerton for me right now. I mean, with the, <laughs> with, the, with, the with the background, the, 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 you know, Bridgerton, which I totally adore, um, uh, the background uh, and then the hair, and then of course, the portrait of Henry Maria of France, you know, all of those things wrapping in together because um, in, you know, in this Shonda Rhimes show, like the queen's hair is always phenomenal and always different. And so there's this, like, so you're you're linking something for me right now, which I'm totally loving. And the Masa Zodros one is just haunting and kind of beautiful and creepy at the same time. It's you like, know, I don't want to be attacked by that hair. That hair is coming to get you. And I love it. Well, you know, the reason why that piece was so important to, to me, Dr. Joseph, he was able to elevate the exhibition by bringing in contemporary artists that he knew. You know, my vision originally was going to be most like the historical aspects, artifacts and those kinds of things. And he came and he elevated the show by bringing in these contemporary artists. And uh, the Delita um, Martin piece 
and uh, the matzah piece, the, the reason why those two are so important and with the reason why we put them in the Black Joy category is because when you think about the happiness, you know, that um, one would feel being able to self-accept, um, being able to be the light, you know, like having your hair um, as a spiritual entity of yourself and not something to be ashamed of. Uh, that film, uh, Femme Totem Blue, the name of that, you know, totem, when you think about totem poles, it's a very spiritual, you know, kind of um, structure, right? And so for that hair to be considered a totem, it's like a, a way in which Black people can connect with their higher creator. And so, you know, it was, it was an amazing way to really be able to show, you know, what Black beauty is. Mm -hmm. And that's, to me, those two pieces, you know, really represent black beauty. And I think part of it we have to consider, too, which you don't get from a digital virtual presentation is the scale. You know, like the Kahindi Wiley piece is almost seven feet tall. So we can't wait to get this stuff up on the wall and get people in to see it. Well, and I love that you're talking about the uh, Masa Zodros one in terms of the totem, because totems are also, I mean, just in terms of the... Um, the idea of protector as well as, uh, you, you know, the protecting the community uh, in many different cultures around the world, totems have this quality of protecting the community, uh, sort of warding off evil, things of that nature. And, and that's really interesting uh, to sort of tease out of this a little bit. So uh, the catalog is already out, as we mentioned, though, uh, like Leon said, it's 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 like hotcakes. <laughs> um, it, there's some currently available in the Kent State Museum uh, store. It's also available in Black-owned bookstores across the U.S. So if you want, if you're not sure which ones are in your state, you can look up something like Oprah Magazine's list, which goes state by state. So we have a few questions in the chat, which is really exciting. Um, I'm going to go back to a couple that uh, happened earlier while you were present presenting. Um, and in that vein, now is the time when we all have our cocktails. I'm in the midst of moving, so my beautiful glasses are in a box, um, our old fashioned. So cheers. Thank you very much for the exciting presentation. Cheers. Thank you. Um, and our first question is, um, which is in the chat. Why are you categorizing black hair as controversial? It has been controversial for others, but for us, people of African descent, our hair is us. It is not controversy. Well, you know what? The reason why I'm categorizing it as controversial is because it is. There has still been discrimination happening with black people because of the fact that they want to wear their hair in its natural state because of the fact that we had to place legislation, you know, um, across this nation so that black people won't be discriminated against. So I would call that controversy. And I would say based on the different categories we've used, uh, you know, the black joy section, for example, nothing's about controversy there. So we are thinking about it in different lights and in different time periods. Um, the entire section we have, we have over, 30 or 40 hair combs and hair pins from Africa, from Latin America that have all adorned hair and it's all been celebratory. So part of the politics is, you know, whether you um, intended to or not, you know, the hair has had an impact culturally and you've had to respond to it. Or, I mean, there's, there's, you can look up endless stories of black children being like sent home from school because they had, their hair was too black. From their jobs, people being fired from their jobs because of their choice to wear natural hair. And like I said, you know, the Crown Act was one of the, the it was the first piece of legislation put in place, which uh, they started that act in 2019. So this is very, very recent still that, you know, people are still being discriminated against. So it's unfortunate that black hair is still controversial, but it is, it is very controversial. Thank you. Um, 
Another viewer says, uh, it's great to have an exhibition theme. Did you draw on the current collections or did you make new acquisitions for this exhibition um, and collections? And did you do many loans? So where, so essentially where are your pieces coming from and how much do you have, how much is yours and how much is coming from afar? Can I do this one? <laughs> this is the largest loan exhibition in this museum's history. <laughs> wow. We, I think we have, 70 approximately lenders. <laughs> um, one of the major ones being, as Tamika said, Dr. Willie Morrow, who um, he's a pioneer. He's, is he in his 80s or 90s, Tamika? Yeah, he's, yeah, he's in the, about in his 80s now, okay. yeah. And so, you know, Tamika and I were very fortunate. We got to go out there and look at his personal collection of um, kind of artifacts and things he's collected for decades. Um, one of the things we didn't get to show is, uh, you know, from antebellum U.S., a corn grinder that slaves would use to get the husk out of the corn, to get the corn out of the husk, and then put the husk in their hair and comb it out to, to pull the oil out of their hair. That was the only hair care that was possible at that time. So we have these kinds of artifacts all the way down to the Madam C.J. Walker tins and things. Um, so, but that's just Dr. Morrow's collection. We are borrowing from some great partners like the Fowler Museum at UCLA. We're borrowing from um, the Cleveland Museum of Art. Um, a lot of different personal uh, collections like uh, the actress CC Pounder is lending several pieces from her collection. So, and then a lot of it is just working with the artists or, or a couple different estates to, to borrow things. Yeah. Oh, Are we there... were even lucky to have a couple people um, commission pieces. So we had a couple artists that actually did pieces just for our show. Yeah, we were able to commission two separate things. And and it was interesting because the, uh, the museum's uh, collecting history has been primarily around costume and dress. And so a lot of the things we got or lent, I, we didn't purchase very many things at all. It's, it's very heavily a loans exhibition which is one reason we're not able to tour it. You know, it's, it's by collecting so many things in one space, it was, and and our exhibition duration is a little abnormal. A lot of museums show something for like three or four months. Ours is up the entire academic year. So that's a long time to borrow a piece of art to then ask the collector, can we send it somewhere else for another six months? You just answered two of my questions, one about <laughs> It was going to tour and to um, uh, uh, like how long is it up for so those are both great things um, so my next question for you is um, this is a personal one in terms of this do you um, do you feel like the the objects in the collection more come out of personal collections than out of mm, how shall we say publicly accessible or museum collections we have we have a mix, you know. We're borrowing a piece from the University of Kentucky Art Museum. Uh, I don't have the full list of lenders in front of me. A lot of it is coming from the artists directly. I would say, of the fifty-ish artists, you know, forty of it, forty of them or so are coming from the artists. So it's been really nice to interface with the artists and have them feel like partners in the project. Yeah, that has been a that like that's been an amazing experience to you know to see their response um you know once we got the book uh ready and it was uh you know ready for distribution we sent all of the um lenders including the artists um a copy of the book and just their expression um april bay's uh response was just amazing she was basically like in tears you know she was just so excited to see her work you know represented in such a, a wonderful way and so it was, it's been amazing to work with them, like, you know, to really get to know them, you know. When did you start planning this exhibition in the book? So how long has this been in the development phase? Meeting number one was September 2017. <laughs> wow, fantastic. <Yeah. laughs> um, and you, you told me earlier that the book is now in its second printing. So um, are there plans for it to go into a third printing? Yeah, I don't know if it's technically already in the second, but I know stocks are quite low across the board. So I think they were talking about doing a second printing. Um, we, we could get back to you on that, but it's it's exciting just knowing that there's been that much demand. 
Okay, we have a couple more questions from the audience. One, um, this looks like a great exhibition. Who are some of the scholars, philosophers, and theorists you use to research ideas of inclusivity, exclusivity, social order, colonialism, when you were thinking about the concepts presented in the exhibition? Okay, so I can answer that. Uh, a lot of the work that I've done, um, my research has been focused on the social, psychological aspects of hair. And so there's authors such as um, Cheryl Thomas, um, Ingrid Banks, um, who else? Afia. Yeah, uh, yes, Afia and Bilisaka, yes, definitely. And so uh, these scholars all have their different little, um, little uh, like research area in which they, they focus on and, and Dr. Bilisaka, one of the reasons uh, she was so important for us to be able to have a connection with is because she really looks at the psychological aspects of what hair does. Uh, there's, there was a, a study called the, the, the Good Hair Study and it talked a lot about the anxiety, the stress, the trauma that black people have had to face about their hair. And Dr. Mbilla um, Saba, she works with people who face, you know, those kinds of things and, and are trying to work through those things. And so, yeah, those are some of the um, scholars that we worked with. We um, were really fortunate because the catalog actually has six essays at the beginning from some of these people. So Athea, Athea contributed an essay. Lori Tharps, who wrote the hair story book, um, contributed a short essay. And then Tamika and I each have one. So we put in a lot of different perspectives. We really didn't want it to just be an art book. So we kind of have the psychosociological, we have the historical, we have an art critic, we have, um, Tamika's really focuses on a lot of like personal narrative and then the subsequent research. So it's all these different lenses, which kind of go in hand with the themes to say, this isn't an exhibition, just like a, a static, you walk through, you read some labels, you learn something. It's, you can think about hair as an aesthetic art choice. You can think about it as a political act. You can think about it in terms of the kind of personal traumas that happen or the personal you know, triumphs as you mm -hmm. come to that piece with your hair and its texture. So it's, it's um, if we had a little bit of trouble putting together the bibliography in the back of the book, so you can like, you know, have all these sources if you want further reading, you know, it, it's got it's got over a hundred plus entries of just like hair as art, hair as this. So it's it's really multifaceted, and we had to, and and I but I think that's what worked well in our collaboration. You know, Tamika's a designer, and I'm a historian, and you know. I think about museum and, and spaces, but we neither of us felt tied, I think, to our specific pedagogy in trying to nail down the right way to tell this story. There's so many ways to approach it. And just like, you know, uh, being a black person is complicated, you know, being a black person with black hair is complicated and complex, you know, and so we really wanted to show the complexity, of, you know, complexity of it all. The, the, like we said the, and earlier, the, the depth and breadth of what black hair is to the culture. One of the things that was so important for us was for our patrons, our audience, to be able to leave with a better understanding of who black people really are. Um, and that was important for me personally because I honestly don't, I don't believe that we can end racism or end discrimination until we come to a place where we can all have an understanding of each other. Um, a lot of discrimination happens because people are too afraid to learn about other cultures. And this particular exhibition is going to give people an opportunity to learn, to get connected and close and, and look at the humanity of what black hair is. And so that's, you know, that was something that was so important, you know, for us. And like I said, you know, Kent State University is a predominantly white university. And so most of the people that are going to come through that show are probably white people. And so it was important for me to be able to tell that story to my white brothers and sisters so that they can have a better understanding of, of my, of who, <clears throat> excuse me, of who I am and who, you know, the rest of, you know, many people in the black culture are. 
It's a great example of the personal becoming artistic and the personal becoming political in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the, the work that many of us do and the research that we do. But this is a great example of that. And I think you elucidated that so clearly. Um, we have a couple more questions from the audience. Um, one is, are you actively collecting in this area or is this a one-off? Meaning, I think that's a question for the museum, really. Yeah, so that's, I, maybe we didn't actually address that dynamic. Uh, Tamika, neither Tamika or I work for the museum. We are both faculty, and so we are guests curating the show. So we don't actually have any kind of say in acquisition policy or anything. But, um, I mean, it'd be great if the museum, you know, had a really intentional, diverse um, policy, or, or had a policy in intentionally thinking about um, diverse stories. Yeah, um, I can say um, my experience with uh, the museum, uh, Sarah Rogers is the director for the Kent State University Museum. And since she's come to Kent State University, she has had it um, as a mission of hers to diversify that space. And one of the things that she did was, um, you know, acquiring pieces. Um, I actually designed a piece um, called The Vortex of Black Propaganda Protests. And that piece she actually purchased for me to be able to have in their uh, collection, you know, for, for people to learn from. And so she's, she's made it her mission uh, and the museum's mission to diversify the space and, you know, for people to be able to have a, a, a variety of things that they can learn from. I've had the similar experience with the Archives and Special Collections at LMU. So this is a shout out to our fabulous partners on university campuses and museums and special collections. Reach out to them. They want to buy things for us. They do. Um, so play with them. They like to play with other people. Um, a few more questions for you uh, as we're winding up here. Um, what what uh, were their foundational items that helped to structure the exhibit? I think the Sabandi was pretty foundational, also because of the size of that 16-foot platform. You know, when we actually started design, like designing the installation, we were like, well, this one's got to get a spot first because, you know, you can't wedge that one in a corner. So um, I think that one even just kind of scale-wise became one of the hallmark pieces. Yeah, and the work from, or the archives from Dr. Wooly Morrow, you know was a major um, contributor so a lot of you know the planning and everything that we did came from all the items that we were able to, to um, acquire from his collection and so his his pieces um he has pieces in every category community and memory black joy politics so it was um important for us to be able to use his collection because i think we got like almost over 50 pieces from him right oh i think we have like 90. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. It, so did you a, did you reach out to him, or did he hear about this and reach out to you? Um, um, yeah, we. I I had known about Dr. Morrow because of the book Four Hundred Years Without a Comb, and um, I heard that he was still alive, and um, you know, found out about him, and I <clears throat> told Joseph, I said, I'm going to San Diego. Do you want to go with me? Because I'm about <laughs> to go meet Dr. Willie Morrow. And Joseph and I went to San Diego. We got a chance to meet him. He was an amazing, amazing man. And, um, you know, we just, we hit it off. And so, it, you know, he's been a, a, a major part. And we're really blessed to have been able to meet him and to be able to have his input in the show. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, another question from the audience. So would you say that black hair is, contra is only controversial outside of Africa? Oh no, it's controversial in every every place that you can find a black person, black hair is controversial because of the fact that every place where you can find a black person, there's been colonialism happening there. And that's the reason why, you know, because of that colonialism, that's the reason why black hair has been a controversial topic since colonial colonialism. So any place that you can find black people, you know, and a perfect example is this, okay? So several years ago, um, I got a chance to go to Ghana, and I was very surprised when I went there that many of the African women were wearing their hair straight. Not many, 
were wearing their hair in its natural state. But what also I had to understand is that they only had their independence from, from Britain for like the past maybe 55, maybe 60 years. So their brain was still wrapped up in all of the things that they had to deal with with that colonialism. So any place on this planet that you can find black people, there's gonna be some controversy. Yeah, and you know, controversy, uh, you know, I think there's so many ways to think about that. That you know, like, is it? Are there cultural tensions? Are there like different pushback? And yeah, um, a lot of my research is in Senegal, and a lot of women are getting their hair straightened or wearing wigs, or you know, and and some of it is you. You just have to figure out where some of these um, messaging about beauty is coming from. Is it is it from pop culture? Is it from you know American TV shows that are being shown somewhere else? It's also what's stylish and trendy, you know. And it's really interesting seeing black hair showing up so much in pop culture. I mean, it, it's been in pop culture forever, but just in recent years, you know, Lizzo is having music videos in a barbershop, or there were the barbershop movies, or you know, there was just that uh, movie. Uh, bad hair, which is like a horror movie about black people's hair that like comes alive and eats them. You know, the hair, it keeps showing up in, in all these different registers. And so, yeah, even in Africa, which of course is like this monolith, you know, we, we should get more specific, like what, well, in Nigeria, we have a piece by Karo Akokiere, um, who's a Nigerian artist um, based in Germany. And he is, did this digital poster of men wearing different hairstyles because like when you go to a barbershop in certain parts of West Africa you just point to the board like which haircut mm -hmm. you want so he's copying that format but he put different names of religious hairstyles like well if you're this kind of Christian you have this one if you're this kind of you know uh, you know I need to raise money it's this kind of hairstyle so you know even if it's not controversy there is within each very specific culture, different tensions about like, why is hair that way and not that way? Mm -hmm. There are lots of congratulatory comments in, um, in the chat, which I will allow you to read later on on your own. Um, but there's one in particular that I want to share with you from uh, from one of the viewers. My friend's adopted children are black and they live in a predominantly white neighborhood. I'm going to share this exhibition with them because there's so much beauty and power here. No one should be telling these babies that their hair is wrong. What a wonderful and inspiring presentation and exhibit. So, uh, uh, so yeah, so um, you're, the work that you're doing is really interesting and, and really breaking down barriers around questions and, and fear of asking those questions. And, and, and I think that's amazing and interesting. I have one last question for you. What's the oldest object in the collection or in the exhibition? Yeah, so that's definitely going to be some of the Egyptian pieces that we're getting from the Cleveland um, Museum of Art. Um, we have different silver ornaments that you would have put in your wig. Oh, so yeah. we have an array of different little ornaments. And then we have some small um, kind of statuary figures where the hairstyle is really important to identifying them. Um, there's like a there's a statue of Konsu, and he wears a side lock, so it's just his hair coming off the side, and it's a way of acknowledging his youth. So yeah. in a sculpture where there's not very many details, right? The body's kind of simple, the head's kind of simple. The hair is the way that you're able to like tell that story of that person. There's one last great quote in the um, comment in the section, and then we'll wrap things up. Um, uh, there are quite many parallels with Japanese traditional hairstyles or contemporary coloring away from classic, classic Asian black and straight. This is a very exciting exhibition and look forward to seeing your book, Regards from Kyoto. So, um, Tamika and Joseph, I just want to say thank you so much. Um, I want to get on a plane right now and come see this. Um, <laughs> and since you have all these objects, I might just darken your door and be like, I want a private backstage tour. Um, uh, and then we can go and have cocktails in person together in mass if need be. Uh, but this has been so exciting. Um, thank you so much for your time today and for talking about this and the work that you're doing and, and sharing your ideas about collaboration and how 
many of our many of our viewers are in the academy and this interdisciplinary work is so important for us to do in order to to share across our disciplines and our backgrounds and our communities in order to do this i'm particularly touched by some of the things around the queer artists that you talk about as a gay man um, and so those are things that are resonating with me um, and so with that, I want to say thank you to our audience for coming today. Um, once again, we would like to thank our guests, Tamika Ellington and Joseph Underwood for their time and their work. Uh, and we thank all of you for attending. So please follow Costume Society of America on Facebook and Instagram, and make sure that you hear about all of the upcoming episodes of Conversations on Dress. And if you enjoyed today's content, we implore you, and I say this with a cocktail in hand, now you should get a checkbook or a credit card to uh, donate to CSA. Um, if, uh, there is a link there, or you can send checks to the, um, the, the uh, address on the screen to help keep this content free and going. So, and with that, I want to say one last Uber thank you to uh, maybe I should do this way instead of a bowing thing and like a raise up thing. Yes, here we go mm -hmm. to Tamika and Joseph. It's been a pleasure to talk with you and to get to know you um, for this process. And I'm so grateful for your time today. Well, thank, thank you for the invitation.